Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Compound. I am here for my regular check-in with two of my favorite people in the markets, Nick Collis and Jessica Rabe are here. They are the co-founders of Data Trek Research and the authors of Data Trek's morning briefing newsletter, which goes out daily to over 1,000 institutional and retail clients. They're also two of the smartest people I know. Nick and Jessica have their own YouTube channel, which you can find a link to in the description below. Nick, Jessica, good to see you. How's, how's everything? Good to see you too. Well, good. thank yeah. you. How about you? Uh, doing, doing, doing okay. Somehow, it's pretty much November, and I'm not quite sure how that happened, but here we are. What? You're like, oh, what, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, today, we're going to try to use data to solve the biggest question on everyone's mind, I think, other than who's going to win the election. The Federal Reserve basically just declared victory over inflation and cut interest rates by 50 basis points. Why on earth did the yield on the 10-year treasury respond to that by rising 50 basis points? So I wanted to just kind of lay out four scenarios here, and then I want you guys to weigh in on what you think is going on. Number one, um, it's a head fake, meaning this rise in the 10-year yield we've seen will melt away as quickly as it came. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Number two, the bond vig vigilantes are uh, out uh, talking about deficits and the national debt. Paul Tudor Jones was on TV last week talking about it. And there's like real concern for the first time that we've really gotten too far uh, out over our skis. Number three, it's just an unwind. A lot of money was betting on a recession. A lot of money came into bonds. Now that it looks like recession is off the table, they're selling those bonds and that's where you get the 10-year rising. Or number four, it's a brand new market bet on higher growth, stickier inflation for 2025. So I want to get to kind of some of these scenarios and what you guys think is happening. Yes. Well, first of all, I think it's entirely fair uh, that people are questioning if the Fed just made a policy mistake, because quite frankly, the Powell Fed has made a few pretty bad errors over the years, of course, overestimating the neutral rate of interest in 2018, which led to a, a short bear market in Q4 to then also saying that uh, inflation inflation was transitory in 2021. In both cases, the Fed had to pivot hard and quickly to address those errors. Uh, in this case, we think the backup in yields really comes down to data that continues to show that the U.S. economy and labor market are stronger than expected. So three quick charts just to uh, just to lay this out. The first being uh, initial claims. If you could just please put that up, thank you. Um, so this shows this shows U.S. initial jobless claims for unemployment insurance readings since the start of 2022, and we pay close attention to initial claims because they give a real time look into the strength of the U.S. jobs market. The latest initial claims for the week ending October 19th came in at 227,000 on a seasonally adjusted basis. That's just 3% higher than the longer run average of just under 220,000 220, since the start of 2022, which we marked with that, that dotted red line you can see on there. And it's also 5% below the four week average of just under 239%. Now, continuing claims- 239,000. Correct. Yeah. yeah gotcha. Now, okay. Continuing claims did rise to just shy of 1.9 million on a seasonally adjusted basis. And that was, that's back to levels, um, last seen in, uh, November, 2021, but they were also above 1.9 million, uh, in late 2017 and early 2018, uh, at the end of the last economic expansion. So overall, we think that all the jobless claims data does show that we still have a decent, uh, U.S. jobs market. And we also we also have another uh, another chart that shows a, now a non traditional real time labor market indicator uh, with U S Google Trends search volumes for ask for a raise over the last twenty years. And uh, just three quick points here: you can see U S Google searches oh, for this ask. Is funny. This is funny, uh, Jessica. How long have you been tracking this? <laughs> a while, and it's it's freaky how much it lines up with the with the data. So U S Google searches for ask for a raise 
peaked in June 2022, shortly after average hourly earnings hit a post-pandemic high of 5.9% in March 2022. But then as, a, as U.S. workers have lost confidence in their ability to demand higher pay uh, since, as shown by declining searches towards the right of the chart, average hourly earnings have also fallen steadily, now at 4% as of September. But search interest for uh, an ask for a raise is still 17% higher this year than in 2019, um, again, at the top of the last uh, economic cycle. So as a result, uh, earnings growth still exceeds the, the 2019 average of 3.3%. Uh, so the upshot here is that wage growth remains sticky because U.S. workers still feel they have decent bargaining power with a still uh, growing U.S. economy. And then uh, our third chart well, on just the, to pause there, uh, yeah. we're taking that we're taking that as a positive, even though yeah, it's, it's somewhat it shows, stickier in terms of inflation. It's a positive on the economy. It's good for for corporate profits, definitely. Okay. Def, def, yeah. Okay. And then uh, just and then that that's a good segue into on the economy. We have a chart of the Atlanta uh, Atlanta Fed's GDP uh, now model, and this is for Q3. And this is what we really think is the crux of why yields have risen over the last few weeks. The model was forecasting 2.8 to 2.9 percent growth for Q3 in mid September when the FOMC cut rates by 50 bips, but its prediction has trended higher since, as the models incorporated new data in real time. So this past Friday, it forecasted 3.3 percent growth, which was the last revision before the release of the uh, advanced Q3 GDP report tomorrow. And if that number comes true, it would be the highest reading this year after growth of 1.6 percent in Q1 and 3.6. 3% in Q2, and it would even be higher than Q4 2023's 3.2%. So our bottom line here is that the U.S. economy seems to have had a decent Q3 and solid momentum uh, heading into Q4 and uh, 2025. So we think it's the, the strong economy that's pushing yields higher. Yeah. So Jessica, it sounds like you're in the C and or D camp. It's an unwind of recession bets combined with maybe a new market bet on even higher growth, even though that higher growth will come along with higher prices. And I suppose that's the optimistic case. Uh, even if you hate inflation, you probably hate uh, a national debt crisis a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, okay. and you've even seen uh, Fed funds futures adjust expectations coming more in line with the, the FOMC's last projections to now just a 25 basis point cut in November, again in December, and then just two 25 basis point cuts in the first half of, of next year. Okay, Nick, you look like you want to weigh in on this. I do. Um We've got a chart of 10-year yields going back a long, long way, back to 1962. And I just turned 60, so I was born in 64. And I was just thinking about that and thinking about yields, and I pulled up this data, and I think it's worth a, a, a strong look because – 4.2% yields right now were exactly the same in October of 1964, um, so right. 60 plus years ago. Debt to GDP was 41%, and I've broken down the rates into their components, which is inflation expectations and real rates. And you can see inflation expectations or inflation back then was 1.7%. That makes real rates 2.5 to get to your 4.2. And um, you know, real GDP or GD, debt to GDP was quite low, 41%. You go forward to 20 years ago, October of 2004, and rates were 4.6%. Inflation was a little bit higher than back in the 60s. Real rates were a little bit lower. Debt to GDP was higher, 61%. And now we're back in the same place, 4.2% yields, right in line basically with 60 and 20 years ago. So no change there. Inflation is running about average between the two. Uh, real rates are a little bit lower. And debt to GDP is double what it was in October of 2004. So looked at over the long term, it's hard to argue that the market has incorporated any of the increase in federal debt, any of the increase in deficits, because even though we're running twice the debt to GDP, we're still running the same nominal rate. And it's anchored on inflation and real rates, which historically are very much in line with what we see today. So there's by this measure, at least, literally nothing to the argument the deficit has anything to do with yields, period. It's so nice to hear you say that definitively, even though the message of this chart is somewhere out there, there is a limit, 
and we don't know when we'll hit it. Um, but if we were 41% jet debt to GDP in the 60s, 61% 20 years ago, which they all said was too high. Now we're 120%. Maybe the limit's 140%. Maybe it's 180%. But you guys are arguing it's not here. And the evidence of that is look at inflation, look at real rates. We're, we're, we're pretty much in the same place on both throughout this entire, I don't know, 60, 70 year period of time. That's 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 the upshot. That's the upshot, and that's that's just very clearly what the data says. And I think you make the right point. We don't know where the number is, and we don't know how steep the S curve is once we start to hit it. But to say that we're near it and the market's responding to it is just flat out wrong. That's not the way it's working. One of the other big memes making its way around the markets right now is we've never had a year where both gold and the S&P 500 were up 25% simultaneously. Is that the number? Yeah, and it, it's yeah, it's like 25, 30. Gold's more than 30. Gold is up 33% year to date. Silver's in the middle of a huge rally. You point out 36% year to date, back at its 2011 highs. Gold is well through the 2011 highs. Uh, and Bitcoin's hanging in there toward the upper end of the range. What is the message there then? If, the, if, if we're not getting deficit... Uh, concern necessarily from the bond market, and that's more an economic growth story. Is the economic is the debt concern happening in gold, silver, Bitcoin? Don't think so. What's happening with okay. gold, which is dragging silver up in its wake? Silver is like a high beta version of gold. It's gold plus some economic cyclicality because of fifty percent of gold or more than fifty percent of silver usage is industrial, uh, where just like five percent of gold is. Gold's a whole bunch of other things. But the issue with gold is that non-U.S. central banks are buying a ton of gold, literally tons of gold. So before the twenty twenty. Gold production annually is like 4,400 tons, and central banks outside the U.S. would take about 10% of it and buy it for their reserves. Now the number's north of 20%. So they've upped their gold purchases by roughly double in terms of per percentage of supply annually. And the reason they're doing that is gold is a better reserve asset in some ways than treasuries, which is the more common reserve asset for non-U.S. central banks. Because unlike treasuries, once gold is inside a country's vaults, they can't, it can't be confiscated, it can't be sanctioned. And and after what happened with Russia and the U.S. dollar, I think a lot of central banks are saying we need to diversify our holdings of reserves. And one of those diversification tools is gold. So they're buying a lot more gold than they used to, and you're seeing it in the price. So I don't see it as a sign of deficit worries per se. I see it as a sign of the dollar being not quite as much of a safe haven uh, in a dicey geopolitical world. Sure. If the, if the EU and the United States decide that an action taken by a sovereign country flies in the face of international law and they want to make them pay and they want to do sanctions or they want to freeze numbers on a screen, fine. Can't do that with gold bullion. Nope. Nope. It's it's not a you know, not a QCIP based asset. It is a physical right. asset. And once it's there, you got it and it's yours. And there's real value to that. And it's not just China. China's a big buyer, obviously, but it's India, it's Central Asian Republic, it's Poland. So it's a lot of non-aligned or relatively non-aligned countries that just want to have some flexibility in their reserve assets. Yeah. I, so I've, I've had this heuristic where I've said gold is not really a bet on faster inflation, although it can be. What it really is, is a bet on continued political instability or a hedge. Maybe a better way to phrase it is a hedge against political instability between countries. And I think it's not a coincidence that the last big peak in gold was 2011 where we had the debt ceiling debate here in the United States, we had the European financial crisis simultaneously, um, and you know this this one seems to be occurring with uh, the Russia Ukraine conflict in the backdrop, increasing hostility from Iran, questions about our relationship with China, uh, the re the re rise of Trump. So like that 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 gold price rally seems to make sense more in that context than in the idea of like a reignition of CPI, for example. And yeah, you, that it sounds like right. you guys agree with me. Yeah, gold's okay. a global asset and global demand drives it. And if you find incremental global demand, and in 2011, it was also the Chinese middle class buying gold um, because their stimulus was so much more effective than ours post-financial crisis that you ended up with a strong gold price and you're getting the same thing now. I want to go back to uh, Paul Tudor Jones. Last week, he appeared on CNBC and he doesn't do that all the time. 
Uh, it's usually concurrent with something he's doing for the Robin Hood Foundation, where they raise a lot of money for uh, under, underfed uh, New Yorkers and people all over the world. It's an amazing cause. Um, but he probably expressed more concern last week uh, than he has in prior years making this appearance. And his message was, we're finally at this moment where the federal debt matters. And the fact that those comments occurred while we could all look at our screen and see that 10-year yield rising, I think really scared a lot of people. It seems to have somewhat subsided in the last couple of days, but I've been waiting all week to get your your, your take on um, PTJ's comments and whether or not they exacerbated the rally in bond yields. Yes, I mean, they certainly did. People listened to him, and rightly so. He's brilliant. Um, and obviously, it made us think about this issue, talk about this issue a lot, and kind of this is where this 60-year chart data, you know, the genesis of that came from thinking about this over the long term. I guess what's missing for me from his argument, which I get at a numerical level, is what's the catalyst? Every trade needs a catalyst. So what exactly is going to happen? Is it a failed auction? And more from a big picture standpoint, if the money is not going to go to the U.S., if it's not going to go to treasuries, where does it go? Do you really want to invest in euro-based bonds? Not really. I mean, the euro is not as solid as the U.S. as far as an economic entity. You're going to Chinese bonds? No. Uh, Japan? No. That's a U.S. What's, bet, uh, what's Japan. The, what's, <laughs> what's the alternative? So right. I was really hoping he'd like list out the catalyst, but it seems more like he's looking for some invisible hand of the market to push us up the S-curve on this crisis. And okay, I just, I just didn't hear the answer as to what's the catalyst. Uh, what, if, what if we can't think of what the catalyst is, but we've basically piled up all this kindling and when it arrives, it almost won't matter. Uh, or, is, or is that too, too abstract to worry about right now? No, it's the right mental framework, right? It's the same sort of concept as the S-curve. I mean, I think what he's trying to say is that the relationship between crisis and debt level is not linear. You're not going to slowly work your way into it. It's going to hit a point where you go up the S-curve really fast on crisis while the incremental debt is not very large. And the point of that 60-plus year chart was to say, we've been doing this for a long, long time, and there's nothing to say that rates at this point have any relationship to the deficit. So I guess the question becomes, why now? Guys, I want to do the betting odds on uh, the 2024 presidential election. So uh, people are going to hear this Monday and Tuesday on video and audio. We're still a few days out from the election. Normally, the S&P 500 would right now be as volatile as it gets. If you look at a composite of the election run-up, uh, we really just didn't have that pre-election volatility. Uh, I think the big question on a lot of people's mind is, oh, are we going to have that after the election this time? Or maybe we had it in August and, you know, we we kind of got through it. And I guess we'll, we'll all find out the answer together. But uh, what what are, what are we saying here with uh, with the data that you guys have? I think we got a table of the betting odds. This is from a couple of days ago. And all this is is a summary of all the different offshore betting uh, markets for this event. And you can basically bet on this. You know, It's a little bit harder to bet on an election in the U.S., but outside the U.S., it's very easy. And the bottom line is that the odds shades towards, shade towards Trump by, you know, call it 60 to, to whatever it is, low 30s, high um, high 30s, low 40s. So it shades in his favor. Um, but you don't really get definitive numbers from a betting market until you get to 70%. So in practical terms, this is still very close to a toss-up. I wanted to ask you if you think, well, first, this is the first election where I think as many people are part of these uh, bets on whether or not, you know, who's going to win. Uh, I think like for the first time, Robinhood just announced a product that's going to go live in the next couple of days where they're going to allow their users to buy a contract on either Trump or uh, or Harris. So this is now a much bigger phenomenon than it had been in prior years among Americans. Yeah. Uh, would you agree with that? It is. And, and one thing that I've not really seen discussed, but I wanted to bring up you know, here, is there have been big bets on poly market, which is one of the more liquid, like two – Oh, it's a lot of money. It's like $2 billion plus you know, in trading volume on these contracts. And there's a big whale in France who has put 30 to $40 million to work betting on Trump. And I can tell you from having worked for Steve Cohen, traders don't just guess on stuff. They don't just throw stuff to the wind. There's a point to the trade. 
And I can't help but wonder if jacking up Trump's odds was in a way to manipulate or influence other markets, like the peso, for example, which is very dependent on a Trump versus Harris victory. And I'm just wondering if this is all part of a larger trade, where you push up the odds for one candidate that has a clear impact on capital markets, and then trade those other markets to make your money. And you don't much care if you can't unwind the whole Trump trade before the election, or maybe you don't, you, you just let it ride, but you're making a lot of money in the assets that are affected by this new market for predictions in US elections. Well, this is binary though. So if, if, if you have this trade on, and I don't know what the trigger is to declare this definitive, uh, is it, uh, is it uh, a certain amount of states uh, have to have their ballots in or like, how do we even know who wins this? Oh, there's rules behind every contract and they vary a little yeah. bit, but you know, it might actually just go to the certification in January. Uh, but okay. the point of, of the fact that this is new, as you said, this is a new concept. This is a new way of thinking about who's going to win the election. We used to just use polls and polls kind of didn't work all that well in the last 10 years. And so the betting markets have become part of this conversation. But the issue is that the betting markets now have influence on capital markets. And so to some degree, if you push around the odds in an illiquid market, and create a better situation for another trade in another market, that is a way to make money. Jessica, if you had to guess, would you say that the betting markets will become more accurate than the surveys and the polls? Um, maybe not in this cycle, but ultimately, as this becomes just a more common thing for people to do? I think so, because people are putting their actual money on the line. Right. As, as opposed to their opinion, which might even not yeah. might not even be their real opinion, depending exactly. on who's asking the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Unless, to Nick's point, people are not actually expressing a view on the outcome, but hedging against the possibility. And they have some other bet that they care more about play somewhere else. And I, mean, and I guess we'll never know. Yeah, ultimately, the number we're looking for in the last election, uh, the prediction markets had 63% uh, in favor of Biden. So that's the sort of number that uh, we can look for to see who will win. Trump is very close to that. Okay. Uh, I want to move on. And you guys have so much great stuff. So I want to ask you guys about um, three-year S&P and NASDAQ rolling returns. Jessica, I know you've been doing some mm -hmm. work on this during the course of the week. Yeah, so we're hearing a lot of concerns that U.S. equities are overextended here now that this will have been the second straight year that both the NASDAQ and the S&P will have rallied. Uh, so to see if th that's true or if uh, both indices can continue to rally for a third straight year in 2025, we looked at the three-year rolling price returns uh, for both indices over the last 50 years. So I thought we'd just first start with the S&P 500. Uh, so this shows uh, the three-year rolling price returns for the S&P over the last five decades. And just three three points here. The first is that the S&P usually generates good returns over three-year periods and rarely goes negative. So the average 36-month month price return from 1974 to now is 29%. You can see that highlighted by the, the solid green line in the chart. And that's a, an 8.9% right. annual compounded return. And uh, even more impressively, the S&P's three-year win rate or the percent of days with gains over the this period is 82 percent. And wow. uh, yeah, it's it's a huge win rate. And then my second point is that negative three year holding period returns really only happen where there's an exogenous economic or geopolitical shock. And you could see of the, them all in the chart with the dates highlighted in red. So you had the, the 1974 to 76 from uh, the oil crisis recession sporadically through 79 to 82 with the 79 energy crisis and following recession, 1990 with the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, early 2000s with the dot com bubble burst. Reversing the recession, 9-11 terror attacks, Gulf War II, 2008 to 2010 with the financial crisis, a great recession, briefly in 2011 from the Greek debt crisis, and briefly in March 2020 from the pandemic crisis. That sounds like a lot, but the important takeaway there is there needs to be a catalyst. Um, and, and, and as far as being worried about if the market's overextended, we've said this in the past uh, uh, on these uh, What Did We Learn episodes. 
A double is a bubble. Um, if the S&P gains 100% or more in a three-year period, uh, which in that chart is marked by the, the dotted green line, history says investors should be extremely cautious. This has happened four times since 74, uh, which we highlighted it. They're, they're highlighted it in the green, date, the green dates in the chart. Um, we're nowhere near it. Yeah, we're nowhere near it. And those are followed by major contractions. And the only time the market was able to keep rallying after doubling in three years was in the 2010s because it had started from such a low level after the 2008 financial crisis. And I think that's kind of what's missing from the current market narrative is that uh, we're we were 2022 was a, a very bad year that we're still crawling out of. Um, so I just have one more uh, point on this chart. Uh, the last one is that through flat Friday's close, the S&P is up 28% over the last three years. That's super close to the long run average of 29%. So if all you knew about the index was its three year was its three year return as of today, you would probably assume that the last 36 months have been pretty routine. They've, of course, not been, anything but it looks but. <laughs> it looks normal. Yeah, anything yeah. but. But like overall, the the upshot here is nothing in this analysis, like you you said earlier, shows that we're close to a bubble in U.S. large caps. If anything, uh, it all looks pretty normal, actually. This is such an important uh, topic and such a great way to explain it to people because I think there's this assumption that black has to follow red, down has to follow up. And a lot of times when bulls and bears are arguing, it, if you just lengthen the time horizon, so people are looking at two years and last, last week, I think, or the week before, was the two-year anniversary of the bottom of the market. And so it's like, well, you're not going to have another two years like you just had, as though they were completely extraordinary. Your point is, well, think about it in three-year terms. We've just seen an average three-year return nothing more, nothing less. And by the way, it took a lot of volatility to get here. And I think that's a really important message for people who are trying to wrap their head around staying long, maybe putting more money into the market at these levels. We did not just come off this incredible three-year period. 28%, the average is 29, no big deal. It's even more stark if you look at the NASDAQ, if you want to just throw up that real quick. Um, Just two quick points here. The first is that the Nasdaq's rallied by an average of 41% uh, over any three-year period on a price basis over the last five decades. Uh, you can see that with the, the solid green line in the chart. That's a 12.1 annual compounded uh, return. And yeah. just like the S&P, the Nasdaq is rarely down over three-year periods. Its rate, win rate's even higher than the S&P. It's 84% over the last uh, 50 years. Um, and the, my second point here is just that the Nasdaq's up 23% over the last three years. That's well below the long run average of 41%. And that's because large cap tech was particularly hurt by 2022's rate shock. Um, so the Nasdaq's actually been playing some catch up, having been underperforming its long run average return over the last three years. So the two key points I'd I, want people to take away from these two charts is that the S&P and NASDAQ do tend to generate positive double-digit returns over three-year periods as long as we don't get a geopolitical or economic shock. And uh, the S&P and NASDAQ's three-year rolling returns have plenty of room to run before looking overextended as long as the economy and corporate profits keep growing. Nick, I bet if you asked even your clients, institutional clients, uh, if they think the last three years was a below average NASDAQ return, none of them would say yes. That's most, true. Ass- most would assume, myself included, that we've just been through an above average three-year period. Yeah, recency uh, bias on parade. 100%. Okay. That's Guys, why, I want to ask why, you about uh, – oh, please. Oh, no, I was just going to say that's why we love three-year returns because it smooths out seasonality and volatility. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you about short, medium, and long-term issues – uh, it looks like we have a VIX chart in here. What do you want to tell us here? Yes, yeah, so let's throw that up. I'll throw up that VIX chart. This is what we showed clients last week in terms of thinking about potential volatility from the election. Because okay. as much as we feel things are pretty well baked in and we're not going to see a lot of volatility, it could be wrong. And so what's the playbook? And the playbook's pretty straightforward. The long run average on the VIX is, uh, is 20, 19.5. We call it 20. One and two standard deviations is 27 and 35. This is a chart of the VIX uh, back to October 20. 20. And if you go back and look at it, if you buy the 
S and P when the VIX gets to 35, that second line, the two standard deviation, you're up six and a half percent on average over the next month with a hundred percent win rate. So if you're looking for a volatility level where you can definitely step in and buy the market, 35 is the one to look at. 27 has been useful as well because we don't always get to those very elevated levels of volatility. But those are the two levels where if over the next couple of weeks something really untoward happens, market gets volatile, the VIX spikes, 27 and 35 are the levels to look at look at. And it's just a simple rule book. We've used variations of this rule book since the pandemic crisis. They work great. The VIX is an awesome signal of near-term market fear. I think that's a really helpful uh, way to think about it. My guess, I don't know that we'll see another VIX spike akin to what we saw in August, September of this year uh, related to the Japanese carry trade unwind thing. Um, But like, would I be shocked to see a VIX at 30? No. Uh, because I understand how how much technology is involved in market trading and yeah. how quickly every algorithm could move to the same side of the boat, especially if they're in risk preservation mode, uh, capital preservation mode. So um, I really appreciate that. Guys, I want to tell people where they can watch the Nick and Jessica show on YouTube. You guys are youtube.com slash at Nick Colas and Jessica Rabe. And that is the Data Trek channel. How, how are things going on the Data Trek channel these days? It's awesome. We love it. You having doing fun? Another, doing doing, another, doing another video this week about the single most important lesson I learned in business school. Oh, okay. I'm all in for that for sure. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about how you can subscribe, go to datatrekresearch.com for all things Nick and Jessica. Guys, thank you so much for joining us once again. We love to have you. And for everyone listening and watching, we appreciate you. Smash that like button. We'll see you soon.